Okay, um, so I'm going to continue as in the second part of my talk. Uh, sorry, the first part took, took a lot longer than I thought. So um, I'll continue here in this video. Um, spectroscopy. Why? Why are we, why am I interested in doing that? Um, first, it's beautiful. Um, if you look at the some of the images we can take with the, putting a grating um, in the optical train, you can see rainbows. Um, it's it's kind of add characters to it. Um, so here's some that Jeremiah did uh, to kind of showcase some of the pretty neat uh, effect you can get. get. Um, but it's much more than that. Um, so for anybody who's really interested in spectroscopy, uh, again, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, there's an exceptional resource in this book. Uh, I, I have a picture here, so go Google it. And I, I highly recommend getting this book and just read it through. It's, it's, it's very readable. Um, it doesn't take a lot of uh, 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 expectation of backgrounds and things. So it, it's, it's very good for somebody who's just want to get an idea and how to actually uh, approach taking spectra. But um, spectroscopy, it's actually, it's responsible for the birth of astrophysics. It's amazing in that uh, before, imagine, uh, you can imagine Isaac Newton um, or uh, Galileo using telescope to kind of look at the, the stars and move uh, the movements so kind of give kind of confirm the uh, Newtonian mechanics but um, well first of all this talk is it's not meant to be technical so I'm gonna don't worry about these big words I'm gonna kind of describe a lot of these in very um, very high level detail uh, high level descriptions it's more meant for just uh, layman's and things so don't be afraid it's uh, it's bear with me here but if, you're, if you start looking at spectroscopy, um, you're really looking at astrophysics. And in fact, most of the experiments done to confirm or discover new astrophysics phenomena, it's actually through spectroscopy. Um, I'll explain why. So think about uh, uh, what's, what's, a, what's a spectrum. Everybody's familiar with uh, with let's say a, a gas um, furnace in our candle. You would see that um, they're different colors. So the very hot part, um, you would have really uh, like bluish uh, portion. Then you get white, and it get colder. You get become yellow, and then you get even colder, become red. In fact, you would you would hear like, like a heater you call infrared, meaning it actually be, it's been longer wavelength than red. Why is that? Because these are essentially called black body radiation. And what that is is that uh, if you have a, you heat up a body, you heat up something, and it gl start glowing, the the heat or radiation that that radiate out, it forms a a curve. What's a Planck distribution curve? It, it looked like this here. So the hotter it is, the more it toward the shorter wavelength, right here, so let's say 6,000 Kelvin, and it get cooler, this can get shift further and further into longer wavelength, into infrared. So you can see if it's hot, it's actually gonna get more on the red ultraviolet color, and it get cooler, it turned P to yellow and, and red. That explains why um, if you have a, a, a gas burner, if you see flames that are, are blue, really blue, that means really hot. And in fact, that's what you want. If you see flames that become like yellow or, or red, that means it's not as hot as it could be. So that means there's some impurities there and things. To kind of explain why, that um, from the, just based on the color, you can kind of gauge how hot that object is if it's glowing. That's called black body radiation. In fact, this distribution is called Planck distribution. And, and this is so cool about that is that Planck essentially is, is considered as the father of quantum mechanics. 
that means that um, this distribution is kind of the beginning of the study of quantum mechanics. So if you're studying spectroscopy, you're both attacking both astrophysics and quantum mechanics in the raw sense. Now, beyond that, um, let's talk about um, uh, these spectra that you've seen this maybe once in a while uh, in literature. When you heat up gas, or, 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 or uh, uh, when gas are excited, um, elements like uh, uh, mercury, this is mercury that's uh, spiked with argon gas. In quantum mechanics, you know, um, you know that there's actually different energy levels. And because of excitations or, or, or relaxation, the energy that give or take are not continuum. It's actually very, very um, discrete. So based on the energy level of these elements, the energy absorbed or energy that, uh, that give out are very quantized, meaning that the way things that come out, the energy comes out, are actually very discrete wavelengths. See right here? These are, these are various different energy levels that, that emit or absorb um, uh, for a specific gas. So for uh, uh, mercury, this is the signature. So what this means is that if you study spectroscopy, that means you can actually um, measure the, the absorption or the emission wavelengths, and you can determine, based on this signature, what kind of gas this is. So now you're looking at the uh, fingerprints of gas just based on just doing spectroscopy. So because of that, what do you get? That's what stellar spectroscopy is. When you measure um, emission wavelengths of a star or anything else, it's a recombination of a, f a few things. The two things that uh, are, are a combination that, that contribute majorly is first, this is the black body radiation right here. This tells you, based on the shape of this big, uh, this, this, uh, this big curve, it kind of gives you an idea how hot the surface area of that star is. And then you see these absorption lines. These are essentially tell you what type of elements is on the surface of that object that's absorbing energy that's radiating from that star or that energy source. So just by measuring the absorption line or this, this spectra, if I can measure this for any object in the, in the sky, I can now tell you how hot that object is and what kind of element is actually on, on, on the surface of that object. So that gives you both chemistry of that object and the, and the astrophysics characteristics of that. Now, um, by knowing the, the temperature of this, this, this object, you can also infer that uh, how hot or how young this object is. Just think about you got a you got a a, a, a bright star. It just 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 was born. So a lot of them are, a lot of them are, are are really hot and usually really blue. Why is that? Because um, in the beginning, a lot of them are are very energetic, and you have um, a lot of hydrogen um, combining each other. So you got very efficient fusion. And that's a lot of energy there. So as time goes on, um, over millions and hundreds of millions of years, these hydrogen depletes and now becoming a different. Um, so once fusion takes its course, now the elements become heavier and heavier, bigger and bigger, because helium become, uh, uh, I mean, hydrogen become uh, helium. And, and so you get more and more uh, bigger, bigger, bigger uh, elements. And now the, you don't have as much fusion um, uh, source to create these energy. So the star get cooler and cooler. So what happened here is that this, this, uh, this big curve will start changing shape to come, start from being really blue to now getting redder and redder until the, toward the end, it become really red. So that's why you hear, you hear about these uh, big red stars and big blue stars. So kind of give you an idea how old that star is. 
And because of these uh, absorption lines, you can also tell what elements are there. Oops, sorry. So just by looking at this spectra, you can infer a lot of different things. But in fact, there's even more in that just by looking at, at um, the contribution of this curve, there may be other things, other uh, uh, temporal uh, phenomena that kind of affect this curve and actually infer a lot of different things to it. I'll kind of describe that a little later. The other thing is that these curve, uh, these absorption lines actually do shift. There's, there's a lot of different things you can actually infer from that. And I'll kind of go through that too. So here's, um, give you some, some example again. So uh, Jeremiah, uh, here's, I think over one night, he kind of um, measured the spectra of a few stars in here. And he actually plotted out that, uh, the, the spectra. You could see, here's some stars that are really blue, and here's a star that's really red. You can now, that, that tells you that some of these stars are really young and hot. Some of these stars, like our sun, kind of, kind of in the middle of the evolution. And here is sort of the end of the life of another star that's really red. Another cool thing is that um, he took a spectra of uh, M77. It's a huge galaxy right here. With the, it's, it's, a, it's a gigantic black hole in the middle. And SETI has shown that this this star, uh, this galaxy, is emitting an amazing amount of oxygen, O3, in the middle. And by looking at, and, and he measured, and he put a, a grading there, and he actually can actually absorb, uh, observed the spectra of the emission from the black hole. And this is the emission right here. So you can tell from here, O3 emission is right there. So that means you can actually measure the O3 emission from the middle of the black hole from this galaxy M77. How cool is that? So I also want to kind of go back to, to original pictures I sent you. Remember I told you the spectroscopy is it's beautiful, right? But it's more than that. You can see from the star field so for, let's say for this star, so you can see the spectra from this star. It's, I'll explain how this it works, but essentially it's, it's, it's just a fraction grading. So from this star, here's a spectra. You can see it starts from, the spectra here is, is a, a violet, blue, and all the way to, to, to red and infrared. But you see the intensity are, are kind of, they're not uniform, you see these, bands, these are essentially absorption bands. So that's the part of that spectra kind of give you an idea of what, what elements are there that are absorbing all these energy. So that kind of give you an idea. But more than that here is that if you really understand what's going on with, uh, with, with um, depression grading, here's Orion. So Orion here is corresponding to, let's say, corresponding to, let's say, this object here. So this is Orion. But look in here. Look at this. What's going on here? These are essentially the, the spreading of the light from that Orion to areas here. So that's why you see a blue, bluish green image of Orion. And also you see red image of Orion. Why is that? Because these are essentially the uh, oxygen O3 emissions and also the hydrogen alpha emissions. So if you if you you've been hearing about these narrow band filters, that's exactly what it's doing. Is that oxygen O3? It's around five five thousand angstroms or so, where the hydrogen is around sixty five sixty six hundred uh, nanometers. I mean sixty five. 650 nanometers. So essentially, you are actually doing narrowband imaging of an object, but instead of putting all together in different channel, you're spreading the color in space. So you can, if you, if this spectra is actually wide, spread far enough, you will see a beautiful rendition of of 
uh, Orion Nebula in the O3 region here, and you'll probably see farther away, separate, separated, separated, a HA rendering of the uh, of uh, Orion somewhere else. So from doing this using just a grading, now you have a extremely super narrow narrow band. Where if you think about that. Right now, you can if you buy a three nanometer wide narrow band filter, they cost really a lot of money, and you need to buy one for every different uh, window. But with the grading, you can actually create a extremely narrow um, uh, rendition of any wavelength you want, and it be spread all the way across in in your image. So if you know how to harvest the data, you now have a variable super narrow uh, band filter to capture any wavelength you want. In fact, if you really understand the, the narrow band, there, there's actually two common um, narrow band windows. One is hydrogen, one, the other one is for sulfur. Because they're so close, it's very hard for, for people to actually um, to, to create a, a filter where you actually separate the hydrogen and the and the sulfur. So typically, a, a, a narrow band of, uh, a filter is a dual band where you have just oxygen and then you combine hydrogen and and sulfur. But if you have a spectrum wide enough, you can actually separate both the hydrogen and the sulfur, and now you can actually become a three different. Uh, you can see all three different. Uh, um, uh, emission windows or, or different elements. So now you have an SHO set of filters, but not even that, you do not limit at that. There's actually different emission lines that are, that are so kind of weak, but so nobody really make, make filters for them. But now, if you know where the emission lines are, you can actually pick a region where that, that, that spectra, that wave thing is spread to, and that becomes your snapshot. So you if you have a very wide, uh, a high dispersive uh, grading. Now you have a you, now you can dial in any wavelength you want, and you can capture that image. That essentially is spectroscopy. If you read into like a ultra narrow band uh, um, uh, imaging, but for me, I'm more interested in the science side. So so that's one of the that's the that is the um, driving force between spectroscopy. All right. So I'm gonna go through, uh, there are actually two different techniques to do spectroscopy. One is objective grading, where you actually put the grading in front of the front lens. And um, I'll give you some examples, and I, I'll focus more on that in this talk. Um, there's the other part where Jer Jeremiah and others has been doing, where they actually put the grading inside the unit. Um, typically, people do that in the focal plane, of the of the light, but I think they put it uh, somewhere outside, uh, in, inside inside optical train. So um, so it has its uh, pluses and minuses. But uh, those are two different ways. Um, both are described in our Facebook group. But uh, I'll focus more on the objective grading next.